you hear me all right? You probably think that I'm pretty well along in years. No. 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 Yeah, good. That pause was so somebody would jump up and say, well, you know, look a day over 35. And I thought it wasn't going to work, but thank you. Uh, but you're absolutely right. And our topic, our topic tonight is early phone systems. And I remember when the telephone came to Auburn. It was the greatest thing for Auburn since the invention of the automobile. It revolutionized uh, communications. You no longer had to pin a note on Fido's collar and send him down the street to invite Aunt Sally to supper. Uh, but it wasn't, it, it still wasn't really good. It was nothing like it is today, just pick up the phone and talk. And our favorite people, Alice Ray and Dick Steelman, are going to tell us about that. Thank you. Good evening. This morning, Dick Steelman and I got together and decided that I would talk first because I went back a lot further than he did as far as telephones were concerned. The telephone company from about the time it started until it went dial was in our home. My mother was a chief operator and responsible 24 hours a day to see that there was somebody staffed at the switchboard. At first, I remember as a little squirt running around that it was in the room next to our kitchen. And that was a no-no to open the door and go running in there as a little kid because the girls were busy on the switchboard. Then when it became, Auburn became more populated, uh, they needed more room so an addition was built on the house and we had a new door. It went from the living room into the office. It was a rectangular room and one side was totally filled with equipment. They were in beautiful wooden boxes with doors that you would lift off and the equipment would be in there. It was about as wide as these tables and they were about four to four and a half feet high. And the wood was beautiful so you didn't see all the equipment but there were thousands and thousands of wires. Telephone is all electric and they couldn't have had phones in those days without electricity. And the switchboards, well, I try being an, an ex-den mother, you learn how to improvise. <laughs> so I got a box and a couple of pieces of equipment from Vince TV, and I spray painted what I remember those stations looking like. It was the wood, which was more of a reddish brown. And then all the markings on here are rows and rows and rows of numbers. Each person that had a telephone, their number was on an oval-shaped drop. When you cranked your phone in your home, it sent an electrical impulse through the wires and the drop with your number would fall down. And the operator would know that there was a call coming in. Somebody wanted to get in touch with somebody. There were rows of plugs along on the desk. When the operator came in, she put on a headset. She had, a, she had a metal plate that would put here with a horn type thing and a strap that went from one end to the other around her neck. And she would, when she came into work and she was to be on duty, she came up to the switchboard and she plugged this into a plug here. 
as a result, she was connected electrically to the switchboard. She would pick up, there were two rows of cords with metal tips on them, about that long, and the bottom part of it was well insulated. She would pick up the inside cord, plug it into the hole underneath that drop, push it, there was a row of little black cams, they call them along here, a little key, and she'd push that forward and say, number please. The person she would hear in her headset, the phone the person wanted. She would pick up the outer cord, plug that in, and if it was a private phone, she would give it two rings. She'd pull that cam back and release it twice. <coughs> that was for a private phone. That was electrically going from the switchboard through that cord out to your house. The next thing she would do is if another call came in, she would pick up that inside cord and plug it in, push the cam open and say, number please. And they would tell the number that they wanted, but maybe it was what they called a party line. That would mean that there was one number, but your house, your number would say ring one, ring two, and that would be how many rings they would get. And it could be four or five people on the same phone number. And so they would plug it in, plug it into the, your number, and then they would pull back on that cam to send the electrical impulses, ring once, ring twice, ring three, or ring four. And only the person that had that number, ring four, was supposed to pick up that telephone. <laughs> the other people were not supposed to listen in on their neighbors. Which of course it always did. But we know they did. And you could usually hear with a hollowness in the phone. You might hear a click, but your phone would sound a little different when somebody else picked up on the line. And of course it caused arguments with people because they would say, you've been on the, long, the line long enough, get off and let somebody else have a phone. <laughs> and it was one of those things that just happened. People are people and they always have been and always will be. Mm -hmm. The operators had a very serious job. They had to know the police chief, they had to know the fire chief, they had to memorize those numbers. And the only ones that were ever supposed to listen in on a phone call was an operator when somebody called up and said it was an emergency, would you get Dr. So-and-so or get the police? The operator would do that, but then they would, if it wasn't too busy, they would listen in to find out if it was an emergency and they were going to need somebody else, something else, and they would automatically start that ball rolling. They would plug into maybe the fire chief and say, you're going to be getting a call, there's a fire at such and such a place. So they did that intentionally so that they could help whoever was in need of help. It was a very dangerous job to have during a thunderstorm because when they would have to disconnect themselves from the board, they would unplug that so that they were no longer connected to the board because that was electric. And if that lightning hit real close, they could be injured. And what would happen many a time is lightning would hit real close and every drop on there with every number <laughs> would come down. Okay. So who are you going to answer? You don't know who called. So they'd take a cardboard and they'd just go right up the whole thing and push all the drops back up again. And if you happened to be cranking at that time to get their attention, you'd have to wait a few minutes and then you'd say, what are they, asleep or something? And they would crank again and the drop would come down singly. 
Auburn only had a few phones. They had three sections in Auburn. 193 and 194 were here. This would be the second one. I remember because our number was 193. You could not call Worcester from your house. That was a long distance call. On each switchboard, they had five what they called trunk lines. These were the very bottom drops down here. They connected with Worcester. So if you wanted a Worcester number, you would have to tell the operator. They would take that second cord and plug it into the trunk line. And they would, they would sit and they had a dial, something like this on their position, and they would dial the number for you. They would also write out on a ticket your number, the number you called, the day, and the time. And when you hung up, I've been trying to remember, but for the life of me, I cannot remember how they knew when a call was done. Maybe there was a light there. I don't, I don't remember how that was done because I was in my er very early teens when it went dial. So to get a long distance to Worcester, the operator had to get it for you and you were charged for that. The operator wrote up the ticket for you. At one side of that rectangle, the boards were here and right opposite that on the wall was a door to the outside. People would come in there, there was a Dutch door. That's always been my favorite type of door. Mm -hmm. The bottom is closed, you can lock it, and the top is wide open when you want it to be. And people would come in and they would pay their bills there because they'd go to the phone company to pay their bills. It was a busy time, but you see, people complain nowadays about their mother works, so they get upset. Well, my dad worked too, but my mother worked and had a family, I'm the youngest of five, and gee whiz, we didn't dare do some of the things that kids do because mom works and dad works. We didn't dare do things in those days because the neighbors would tell, they told on you. I don't quite remember this being in our house. That I don't remember. That's older than I am. <laughs> That's going to. But I do remember this one, and I do remember having this. And where you pick up the phone and dial your own number, dial the number you wanted, and that was updated. That was new. That was fabulous because you could dial your own numbers rather than having to have the operator ask you the number, please. It had to be, I'm trying to think, stations. No, that's not the word. It had to be manned or womaned 24 hours a day. There were very few men operators. They were mostly women and they would come in and sit at, sit at their desk, sit at the switchboard by the hour answering calls. And people are the same today as they were in those days or the same in those days as they are today. Some are nice, some are nasty. I don't remember the numbers of any nasty ones. <laughs> but it was an experience to see that one day you walked, I walked in that place, everything was gone. They built, the phone company built a little brick house down the road on Leicester Street, which is now Church Street, and little by little they moved the thousands and thousands and thousands of wires, and the switchboard operator was no longer needed in Auburn, and the chief operator now had one job raising her family. But that was the beginning of wartime. And it was a very good time for the business to go dial. And 
when things happened, storms happened, and wires went down, we called on the telephone men, the repair men, people like Dick Steelman to come and put the place back together again so that people could have their phones. And I'd like to turn this over to Dick so he can tell you about the ins and outs and the wires that he dealt with. Thank you. Well, I'm going to talk about a little later that she did. Uh, the years that uh, she was uh, talking about was probably back in the 40s and late 30s. Uh, I came to the phone company in 1956. So I'm going to read to you what I have here and I'll show you some of the equipment a little later on. I became an employee of New England Telephone Company in 1956, so I'm telling you tonight pertains to the years that I was employed with them. I was in the equipment installation department. The equipment installer installs all of the equipment, including the switchboards, within telephone buildings such as the building on Church Street here in Albany. Most towns have an equipment building. There are a few exceptions though, such as Sutton, Paxton, Brookfield, East Brookfield, and West Brookfield. That's in this area. They are served by other towns. For example, Sutton goes through Millbury. An equipment installer also installs equipment in hospitals, businesses such as Wyman Garden, Norton's, and so forth. It also takes care of larger banks, Fort Evans, and many other locations. My area covered Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. Notice I didn't say Connecticut because that was a, a different telephone company, Southern Bell. I traveled many miles during my 35 years of service. If you go into a telephone equipment building, the miles and miles of cable, and believe me, miles and miles of cable, might awe you in wiring that you would see. Everything is coded, so a telephone person is not that complex. For instance, in a typical cable, there are five basic colors. There may be 200 pairs of wire in a cable with five different colors. That's all. They are accented by color bands and stripes. The five colors are blue, orange, green, brown, and slate. Tonight, I'm going to try and take you through a basic call from your home to a neighbor's home. Leaving your house is a pair of wires that terminate via a splice on the cable on a telephone pole in front of your house. That cable goes to a telephone equipment building and enters underground to a cable vault. From the vault, the wiring comes through the floor and terminates on a main frame, and I'll show you that in a second. From the main frame, the equipment installer cross wires, and I have some cross wire here. It's 22 gauge wire. To the assigned equipment on the opposite side of the frame. At that assigned location, it is cabled to a line group and terminal. A terminal consists of 198 pairs of relays, of which two are assigned to your home. When you pick up your phone, your assigned relays will operate. This activates a line finder. So, at this point, this is a line finder. It has nine, nine relays, and they're electromagnets, and when they operate, contacts operate, or springs, I should say, and inside these springs are contacts, and the contacts are platinum, so they will corrode. Uh, these are wipers that will go up and down according to the line or the relay that operates, and it finds your line. In back of these are contacts, that's 600 of them, and it finds your line. Uh, this is the next switch in line, and it is select the switch. Very similar, except this has three sets of wipers, this has two. So, to go on, I'll leave this off. As a matter of fact, no, I won't. This is the configuration of a line group. I can hold 
hold it up here. There are 20 switches in a line group, like so. And this is 396 relays with 190, uh, 196 subscribers that are assigned to these relays. And when these relays operate, for instance, if, uh, say, relay number 45 operated, this line finder would go up four steps and then sweep into the fifth terminal. Thank you. Sweep into the fifth terminal, and that finds your line. Um, and we'll go on to the reading here. So, yes. There's a maximum of 20 line finder switches in the line group. That's a maximum. Quite often there's only 15 or 17 in there. The line finder switch then searches for your line. If more people pick up their phones, then there are line finders, which I say there are 20 maximum, uh, they're in trouble. Because there's 198 people that have access to them. So if the 21st person picks up the phone, what do they hear? Nothing. A line finder switch, I'm going to repeat myself here, consists of about 10 relays with multiple contacts on each relay. When your line is found, the next switch will operate. That switch is called the selector. When it sees, you then have dial tone. At home, all you've done is lifted your receiver up. When you have dial tone, you dial your first number. That comes out of the selector. The relays in the first selector will operate in conjunction with your first number dialed. That switch will either absorb the first digit or seize the next switch. This will continue to happen until it reaches a connect 100 of the person you are dialing. A connect 100 is simply another switch similar to a selector. There are 100 people type assigned to a connector. This switch accommodates the last two digits dialed. There are 10 switches in a connect 100. So if you are the 11th person dialing and 10 connectors are busy, you'll hear fast dial tone, which means all trunks are busy. So there's two areas where if you pick up the phone, you're not going to hear anything. When you see as a connector, that switch will operate. A ringing current will be sent to the call party and their phone will ring. You do not hear their phone ring. A separate set of contacts on one of the relays will return to you ringing, which indicates that the call party's phone should be ringing. However, there could be dirty contacts in the relay that sends out the rings, therefore their phone is not ringing and you think it is, because you'll get ringing from the other source. The connector switch is cabled back to the main frame to their cables and phone. And over here, this is a, a picture of a main frame which stands about, oh, maybe 15 feet high. And in Auburn, it's probably about 30 feet long. And that existed back in probably the 40s and it's still the same way today. In which of the frame probably is uh, Oh, maybe 120 feet, 150 feet long, so it's, as you can see, it's quite a bit larger. There are also other types of tall phone buildings. For example, in Littleton, Blackstone, Chesterfield, and Dover, Foxcroft, and Maine, there are underground microwave bomb-proof buildings. They are located about 100 feet underground. There's a tower and hut above the ground you must enter the hut and walk down about 100 feet to a vault door. Then you must key the code in order to enter. The door would open to a chamber, the door would close, and you must key in another code. A second vault door then opens. When you enter, you are met by someone who will ask your identification and ask you why you're there. After you're cleared, you enter a room that's about the size of a football field. It is full of equipment that is suspended from steel work and secured with straps under the floor. This will accommodate movement. One bay of equipment probably weighs 
800 to 1,000 pounds. The circuits are government circuits. The cables are mostly coaxial. One coax cable can carry over 1,600 conversations at the same time via different frequencies. Beneath this room is another room about the same size, again, with equipment including massive batteries and power equipment. I was at Littleton Underground in 1965 when it was being installed. My job assignment was the alarm system. It took me a year with a lot of help to install it. Another type of microwave station is on mountaintops or very high points. They were relatively small in comparison. Some were in trailers, in remote areas with the tower. Others were small buildings with the tower. These also were government communications. One experience that I had in Western Massachusetts happened when I went to a microwave station on a mountaintop. My assignment there was to audit a job that had been completed. After I completed my job, I took the report to the supervisor, which is in charge of the job. And he looked at me and said, did you see it? I said, what? He repeated himself and went on to say that two installers who had done the job had an experience. The procedure was that when you entered the hut, you immediately put in a call to Boston to report that you were there. Alarms had gone off in Boston and they knew somebody was in the hut. When the two installers entered the hut, one of the installers was bent over, plugging in the lighting. The person on the phone who has responded to the alarm told the installer not to move. He didn't. There was a copperhead snake next to his hand. Somehow they killed the snake when they left. They placed the dead snake on the steps. I didn't see it. <laughs> Another unusual incident happened in Milford. A woman called in a trouble on her phone. She told the repairman that her phone did not ring. After they hung up, he called her back. She answered. He said, I thought your phone didn't ring. She said, it didn't, but the dog barks. The repairman thought, oh boy, I've got one here. When he arrived at her house, he made a call to the test board and asked them to return the call. They did. There was no ringing, but the dog outside barked. He scratched his head and answered the phone. It was a test board calling him. To make a long story short, the dog was tied onto a run with a chain to the overhead telephone line. As the dog moved back and forth, the chain wore off the insulation. Whenever the phone rang, the ringing current, which is 105 volts, would shock the dog and he would bark. I would too. Imagine if the dog had been in water. There'd been no more dog. Another quick story. This happened in the late 1980s. The Groton telephone office was being converted from the old step-by-step -step equipment to the new electronic equipment. Myself and one other installer were working evenings, adding new alarms to the electronic office. My co-worker said he was too shaky to make a critical connection. It was very close quarters, so I was elected to make the connection. I made the connection and wiped the sweat off my brow, brow job done. My co-worker picked up his tools and brought him out to the car, and I went to the restroom. All of a sudden, there was an explosion. All the lights went out, alarms were sounding, yellow and red lights were on, panic set in. My first thought was, what did I do? I rushed out, and there was smoke in the equipment room. We tried to start the generators to no avail. We could make some telephone calls, so we called for help. And to make a long story short, a squirrel had crossed the leaves on a transformer in front of the building. The circuit breaker tripped and one phase was el eliminated, creating havoc on our 220 circuits. The air dryer that dry incoming cables operate on 220 volts. The motor burned up, creating the smoke. I was very glad it was not my fault. We buried the squirrel in the backyard. <laughs> Another story. At a location in all telephone offices on the mainframe, there are critical lines such as government circuits, radio stations, and other similar types. The wiring has a red ring around them indicating don't touch. Well, sometimes they fall off, and you guessed it, to cut. This time was not me though. A friend of mine cut a pair of wires 
and the strategic air command was scrambled from West Oak Air Force Base. We were working in Springfield at the time. A second individual had done the same thing while I was working in Plymouth, and a strategic air command was scrambled from Otis Air Force Base. Needless to say, these individuals acquired unique nicknames. There were times when engineers that planned jobs, job changes goof. One such goof was in Grafton that I found. I don't know if anyone else knew about it but me, but from Auburn to Whitensville is a toll call, but to Grafton it is not. The error was, if you dial 839, which is Grafton, then dial 234, which is Whitensville, you get the Whitensville toll free. So I had friends in Whitensville, and I never told anybody, so I could call up nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Last, you're all aware that Auburnites can call all the bedroom towns of Worcester toll free, including Oxford, because it borders Auburn. You can also call Rutland, Spencer, and Sutton. You might say, how can that be? They're two towns out. The reason is that Sutton has no telephone office, they are service for Millbury, which is a bedroom town. Spencer and Rutland bought a Paxson. Paxson has no telephone office. They have Worcester service. So Spencer and Rutland bought a Worcester service, making them bedroom towns from a telephone standpoint. Sutton can call Rutland free, which is about 25 miles plus. I live in Auburn, and I can't call my son in Charlton. It's a toll call. The Auburn border to the Charlton border is about three miles. That's all, folks. Any questions? Can you share the nicknames or can you not say them in public? One of them I can, the other I can. Spocky. <laughs> good good tell, friend of mine. I need to tell you something, though. Change your telephone number. Down on Southbridge Street, two telephone poles in from the library driveway. Mm -hmm. There's a canister with the bands on it that belong on the pole. Been here all winter. You think the guy that shovels the sidewalk would see it, or somebody, or the top of the highway? Yeah. It's still there as of yesterday. I told Chief Fluckers because nobody else would listen to me. I was afraid some kid. They fool around. So I thought, well, yeah. now you're a telephone man, maybe you know the person to call. Well, I did. <laughs> 16 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. retired. for 16 oh. years, so we, uh, we had a lot of ins at those, during those years, but complete new regime and everything is different. Well, uh, it shouldn't be on the ground, should no, it? No, absolutely. No. Um, <laughs> Dick, how's it going straight? What year did I go to Garden? In the early 40s. Yeah. It served me well because knowing the switchboard, because when I graduated from high school with a commercial course, a lot of my jobs, I was a switchboard operator part time. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, before we finish here, I've got a few tools here that were widely used. This one. These are some of his tools. This is a wire gun, uh, electrical. You would put a wire into it, fire it, it would wrap the wire on the terminal. And uh, made it quite easy. They also had manual ones. They also had um, something to take it off and get follow up. This, was, this little thing right here was a very popular tool. It manipulated wires and has a hook on the end that you can pull them out and a groove over here that you can place them in. These were used quite often. To strip the wire, we had a pair of pliers, but it has a little hole up here that you put the wire into and you just skid it. And these were very popular tools. And again, as I say, this is the frost wire that we used. It's 22 gauge wire and that is what we use all the time. 
they did have 20 gauge, they did have 24 and 26 gauge officials across the region. Oh. Officially, it's a test set. Unofficially, it's a Fedinsky, which told, which tells you what it was used for. <laughs> it, we had to use it to test the switches, but as you can probably guess, all you do is plug into a switch, and you can hear anybody and everybody. And you know, when you're working in there, you don't know whether a switch is hung up, whether it's in trouble, especially when it's in the middle of the night. Uh, you, you have to plug into it, and sometimes you go into conversations. So. Show us the first cell phone. Pardon? The cell phone thing. The cell phone? Yeah. Uh, that wasn't quite invited. This is this apparently is a uh, one of the very first cell phones that they come out with. I don't know who brought this in, but this is a cell phone compared to Don. Don. Maybe you could say something about this Don. Uh, I've used it. Yeah. That's all. Compared to what they have today, yeah. quite a bit of difference. And uh, these are some of the old, there's some old Worcester directories here. And uh, Rob Roy had supplied this phone here and this one here. And that phone over there was probably one of the most efficient phones that I've ever ever used. And I've still got one at home, and it still works just right. fine. And I had that back in the 1950s, early 1950s. Yeah. Yeah. And these are this is some of the pictures over here. Again, this is the main frame we talk about. And back in the forties is what they put it in. And it's the same thing. It's just a, a frame that the, the wiring comes up through the floor, terminates on here, and you install the wires at the other side of the frame where the equipment cables that go to this equipment are. And these are Alice's uh, pictures here. The switch boards. The switch yeah, boards here. Did you say, I don't know if I missed it, the house you grew up in where the first system was, where in Auburn is, so the address? Um, you know where the congregational church is in Auburn Auburn Center? Uh, you go down one, two, three, four house, 19 Church Street. It's the corner of Church and Westview Street. That was uh, where the phone company was. In, in that addition that now has a porch on there. Thank you. I remember when we had the telephone numbers, you know, the five telephone numbers, and then they had two words before the telephone numbers. Terrace. Huh? Terrace. 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 Terrace
like when there's a storm and the wires go down, you can't get through. Clicking your phone doesn't get the operator any faster. Here, when Kennedy was assassinated, can you imagine how many phone calls there were? There were many people. If they put a phone, they, they got nothing. How much was the typical phone bill when you were first? That I don't remember. I didn't have anything to do with that. That would have been my mother and dad paying the phone bill for people coming in to pay. And I was still just a kid and not allowed to do any of that sort of thing. One thing that we did do is on these two cords that we had, the one we plugged in and said number please and then rang with the other one. If we had company, I can remember one time we had company from California and we went into the, we took them into the office at a very quiet time so they could see what was going on. And we picked up the outside cord and handed it to them and said, hold this. Then we snuck over and put our hand and pulled the cam back. They got a zap of electricity. <laughs> <laughs>